with that. We are into the, our series in Colossians. We started last week on Easter Sunday, and here we are in the second passage. So we're going to, I'll read Colossians uh, not, chapter 1, verse 9 to 14. And so from that day, we, sorry, and so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Okay, so... This passage, one of the things scholars always note about this five-verse passage is how Jewish it is. <laughs> and what they mean by that is Paul is using language that he doesn't normally use, not just in this letter, but in any of his letters. He uses terms and phrases that are so unique that some people think maybe Paul didn't even write it. Maybe Timothy wrote it, because remember, this is being written while Paul's in his first stint in prison in, in Rome, around 61 to 62 A.D., so, they, and he mentions Timothy is there. Maybe Timothy transcribed it, we don't know. But some people think maybe Timothy actually wrote this because he uses very unpaul like wording. I don't think that's the case. I think Paul does it on purpose, as most scholars would say. And he intentionally ramps up the Israel, Israel and Jewish terms and Old Testament terms on purpose. And for instance, he says things like he calls them saints. So the word saint in Greek that he uses is the word hagios, which means holy, the holy ones, the people who are set apart, literally, to be set apart. And that's what the Israelites were called. They're set apart. They're the holy people of God. And when he, he not, that's not all. He says other things. He says they have been qualified for the inheritance of Israel. That's, again, language Paul doesn't use usually. They have been delivered and redeemed, which conjures in the Jewish mind thoughts about the Red Sea and the Exodus. Okay? The Red Sea looms large in Israel's history and still does in synagogues today. They lean on God's faithfulness as the God who has revealed himself as the deliverer at the Red Sea and the provider on Mount Moriah for Isaac and Abraham. And so the language seems to... Paul is intentionally connecting things here. And he goes even further. He uses this idea and says the gospel is bearing fruit in them and in the world. Now, when you hear about bearing fruit, what comes to mind? Garden. Be fruitful and multiply. The purpose that God gives to humanity in the garden is, he says, hey, your job is to take into, come into this world that is unfinished. It's perfect, it's good, it's very good, but it's, there's, he's hidden things in the ground. He's hidden things in the world and said, it's not finished. It's rural. Your job now is to put your hands in the dirt and cultivate it. Fill it with people like you who will glorify God and then build a world that glorifies God. And so they're called to be culture makers, right? So they go out and they're called to do this. Of course, the, the sin and the fall puts a damper on that and it causes sin to come in and make that fulfilling, that calling, that mandate much harder. So when Paul then comes and says to this new church, this young church at Colossae, and says, and uses this language, and he links them to Israel, what he is saying is, this is the new, not the new Israel. He's saying the people of God in the New Testament are now being organized, not as a nation, but as churches. Because there's no longer this Jewish nation that can be ruled by a theocratic king who runs all the laws based on God's law. Now you are people who are in exile, around the world, subject to other secular governments. And so the new organization of God's people is the church. But make no mistake, the new organization has not changed the calling, the mandate, and the dignity, and the authority you have. You are the people of God. Your job is to now go out and to bear fruit in the world, right? And so what Paul is doing is he is saying to this young church that probably could have used some encouragement, and they're hearing from Paul, and Paul's saying, Friends, you're not just a new group of converts to some new religion in the ancient Near East. You are the people of God, the very people of God, set apart, the holy ones, set apart by God, chosen by God, and then mandated to go out into the world to share the gospel and to bring it to bear in the world. That is what Paul is saying to them. And he uses that language on purpose. And then he gets very practical. The letters of Paul are wonderful for preachers because they basically write sermons themselves. 
because he's like, he's got three points. Not that he has to have only three, like I always do, but they're really easy. And what Paul does here is very practical. He says three things. He tells us what we are to do as a church, as, as Christians, how we are to do it, and then how we actually can do it. Okay? So the first thing is, and it goes in the order of the verses. Okay? So the first thing is what we are to do. So let's use a story. Not a real story, it's an example. I have learned in 20 years of marriage to my wife that she loves flowers, and I'll bring her flowers occasionally. What I don't ever do, I don't think I do, is I don't bring flowers on Valentine's Day or Mother's Day. Because if I do, my wife will say, why would you spend four times as much on the same flowers? So, and that's very practical. Maybe you're all the same, I don't know. So I have learned that. The reason I know what pleases her and what doesn't is because I have taken the time to know her. I know what I, and, and when I displease her, usually I know I'm about to do something dumb, uh, but not always. But the reason I know, in a nutshell, I can only know her and know what pleases her by trying to get to know her, right? And so, with that image in mind of trying to please someone in that regard, now think about what Paul is saying here. First thing he says to them is, he says, your Christian life is very simple. In verse 10, this is your job as a Christian, to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in knowledge of God. That's your job as a Christian, okay? Your marching orders have been given. But then he says, incredibly, he says, but verse 10 is contingent on verse 9. You will never be the sort of person who can please God unless, verse 9, unless you are filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding so as to walk in a manner, see? You cannot please God unless you know his will and you understand him and you are wise. And I'll explain those things. So what Paul is saying is, is, and this is something very common, it's an important fact. You cannot please someone if you don't know them. And so let me use an example, uh, and it's, it's, it may cut close to the bone for some, I hope not, but maybe. Uh, well, not this first part. Geologists, not many geologists here. I live in Calgary, so there's a lot of geologists because of all the oil and the drilling. You can know a lot about a rock, but because a rock is not a person, but an insensate, insensate object, right? Because it is an object, you can know about it, but it has no ability, you can't please a rock, right? You would never speak, a geologist, no matter how much you love rocks, you would never think that what you do pleases the rock, right? Because it's an object. And anything you can learn about it, you can learn by you applying your own wisdom to it. But when you're talking about a human being, a wife or a god, a person, god is a person, then you can actually only know that other person insofar as they're willing to tell you who they are and reveal themselves to you. Because otherwise, they can conceal. They can hold things back. I, you only know me so far as I allow you to know who I am. I let you in, right? And this is people. And so if you're a non-believer, and this is me for years, right? I, you know my story before I, I was a, not a believer until university. The assumption, and I see it everywhere still, the assumption is, I may not be a Christian, but listen, I'm, being, I'm a good person, right? I'm, I'm trying to do well. I don't kick old ladies. I don't, I, don't, uh, run, I don't speed up when squirrels are crossing the road. You know, I'm not that sort of a person. And we think, well, actually, I, just, I do it to crows. I hate crows. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> so, but... You see, this is where I thought. I thought, listen, I don't have to be a Christian. Listen, if there is a God, I'm probably okay. Like, I'm, I'm a good person. And listen, that's not the question. But here is the illogic of that approach. What you're assuming is that if there is a God, he will be pleased by whatever way you want him to be pleased rather than asking him how he is pleased. So, the, so imagine now, I show up, and I've said this to you before, imagine I buy Sarah a vacuum on her birthday. I will not be pleasing my wife. Will I? No? Okay, just making sure, because I'm making notes what I can buy her. But no, you see, it's, it would be ridiculous to say, you know, and you see this in marriages all the time. As a pastor, I see it. Couples think that they're not loving one another, and they're oblivious to it. When Sarah and I got married, one of the things we realized was um, her and I were raised very differently. She was raised in a home where her mother was a single mom for a long time. And I was raised in a Portuguese family where the mother was like the everybody loves Raymond mom who did everything, right? And so, in Sarah's home, her mom felt loved when you offered to help because she had a lot on her plate, right? 
My mom, if I said, Mom, can I help you with Thanksgiving dinner, she would take off a slipper and throw it at me. Because the assumption was, what do you think, I can't do it myself? And there's this, this pride. So when I then get married and we get married, I think I am loving Sarah by not helping her. <laughs> I would, and that's, I thought, you know, I got to let her be mom. She knows what she's doing. She, of course, is secretly saying, this son of a gun, if he loved me, he would be helping me. So there's, obviously there's tension there, right? If I, and I didn't know how to please her and vice versa until we knew each other and she had to be open and tell me who she was and what she liked and that way. If you do not know God, if you are not a Christian, it doesn't matter how sincere the vacuum is that you're giving. It doesn't matter how expensive it is, how beautiful a model, how dirty the house is and how much you need it. It will not be received because you don't know what pleases the person. And so if you do not know the God of the Bible, you are not pleasing the God of the Bible. That's very simple, and it's not meant to be harsh. It's just quite logical, really. So if you're a skeptic and you're a non-believer in the room, I get it. But let's at least say, hey, let's at least agree on that. If the God of the Bible is real and true, you are not pleasing him without knowing him. That's what Paul is getting at very simply. And what I love here is Paul's language. He says, they need this knowledge of him, but they just don't just need knowledge. They need to be filled with the knowledge. And if you know your vocabulary and your grammar, the Greek there is, is um, passive, meaning you're to be filled, meaning you're like a cup. You do nothing. You're being filled. The cup doesn't do anything to grasp for the water. The water is poured into it by another. And Paul is saying, you need to be filled with that knowledge because you can't understand God until he tells you who he is. Right? It's like, it's like interrogating a witness. Unless, unless they start talking, you don't know. And God says, no. Paul says, God, I'm praying that God is going to fill you with the knowledge of him, but not just of him, but of his will. And we think about what his will is. We sometimes think it's to know the will of God is to know the future. That's not at all what scripture says. The will of God is the intent and plan he has for everything. So what is God's plan for everything? And if you understand that the will of God is to take this fallen world and to restore it, to redeem it, first of all, from its sin, and then to restore it to the way it was meant to be, then that is, that's understanding, right? God says, Paul says, you need to know the will of God and understand it. So when you understand it, I think there was a slide there, it may have been up earlier, I don't know, with understanding and wisdom. To understand something is to know what God intends in your head. You know it. And if you've attended here for any length of time, you know it, because you hear it every Sunday. The difference now is you don't just need understanding, but you need wisdom. And wisdom is acting upon what you think you understand, right? So, uh, for example, I, I don't make it too comical. Uh, we live in the, on, a, on a big hunk of land, and we have a, an electric fence around Sarah's garden, very large garden. The electric fence, and I joked with my boys, I have five boys, and I remember telling them, hey, you guys know you don't pee on the electric fence, right? Just to make sure. Now, they know, they understand they shouldn't but wisdom is not actually doing it anyway, right? So, and if you don't believe that's a problem, watch YouTube videos. Guys do this. Guys are not smart. That's why we die younger than women, I think. Um, and this is the difference that Paul's saying. You don't just need to know and understand and comprehend the will of God. You actually must act upon it in wisdom because wisdom is acting and be in accordance to what you know to be true. If somebody else fire, fire in the house, you may say, I understand it, but unless you get out of the house, you don't show any wisdom. And Paul says you need both if you're going to be the people of God. This is what you are to do. If you want to please God, you have to know what he wants and then act upon it. And a guy named Dick Lucas, who is a pastor in England, he, I think he's still alive. He's 97, I think. Um, but wonderful pastor and, and writer. And he says this, It is in order to understand how the will of God translates into the everyday business of living in a complex world that the Christian needs all spiritual wisdom and understanding. The harvest of wisdom is works. The knowledge of God should lead to love for others rather than for ourselves. And he's right. So random works of kindness, random acts of kindness are very nice. But does that please God? And here I'll, I'll give you a very simple definition. Good works are those things done by Christians for others for God's sake. Okay? By Christians for others for God's sake. Okay? Simple, I hope. Now, then uh, let me close this last part here. What you're to do is to, is to know God and then to serve him and to 
uh, to, to do his will, to have, do good works, bear fruit. But here's what Paul says. I love it at the end. He ties it all together. Then he says, um, verse 9 and 10 there, um, asking, he prays, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in knowledge of God. See what he's saying? His little, I'll put this next one up, the little cat, the scale. What he is saying is this. If you know God, you're going to do works for God, for his sake. You're going to love the world for his sake, not for your own, not even for the need of the other, but for God's sake to glorify him. And as you serve him, you're going to actually grow in knowledge of him. And as you grow in knowledge of him, you're going to do more works for him. And as you do more works for him, you're going to grow in knowledge of him. And it keeps going. So that the way you grow in knowledge is, there's a lot of ways, right? You grow in knowledge through reading your Bible, study, community, prayer, all these things. But a key one is actually living the Christian life and failing sometimes. But the more you live as a Christian, the more you learn about the God who empowers you to live as a Christian. So that's what we're called to do, okay? Called to live in a life, in a a way worthy of God. And the life that is worthy of God is the one that pleases God. And the one that pleases God is the one that does works in his name for the world. Okay? Good start. Next. How do we do? How are we to do it? I love verse 11. Paul prays, very simple. He prays that we would be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy. So first is interesting. If you're going to live as a Christian, says Paul, you need not just a a little power, you need all the power. The glorious might of God is required to keep you and I faithful to him. That's not just a little power. He's saying you and I are so broken, so prone to wander, so prone to chase our own desires, that we need the glorious might of the Lord of the universe to keep us faithful. And I understand here that when we think about the power of God, depending on your Christian tradition, where you've come out of, you may think about power as more about like a steam engine, right? We think of power as something that has the power, uh, the, the simple might to bend something to its will. That's what we think of as power. We think of that. And so some denominations, some churches, and I'm not going to knock them, but I understand where they're going. It says the power of God is for healing. It's for wealth for bringing goodness into your life, for transforming the world radically with mountains moving and visions appearing. And I understand that inclination. I really do. But Paul doesn't say that. Scripture doesn't really say that. Not really. What it's saying here is you need all of this power so that you can endure and have patience. So that may seem like a bit of a letdown, right? You have this God of the universe dwelling in you, helping you, empowering you to live, and you think, great, now I'm going to finally be the best me I can be, or whatever Oprah is saying this week. And that's not at all what Paul says. He says, no, you need the power to endure and be patient. And if you, if you think that's a letdown, I understand. But here, let's go back to Dick Lucas again, this great pastor. Is this an anticlimax? It may seem so, yet it is true to the business of living for Christ in the real world. For what the... Sorry. For that world is one where Christian, the Christian needs all of God's almighty power steadily to continue and persevere despite the suffering, opposition, shocks, and disappointments that must at times be his lot, doing this not with despondency or collapsing morale, but with joy. And so you and I, you know, the re- I understand why we think that we have the power of God. Great, now I'm a miracle worker. I understand that logic, but it's kind of like um, I play a lot of golf, and uh, golfers are, are delusional. I talked about scrappers, or scrapbookers. So they should be called scrappers. Um, so, <laughs> um, but no, they, golfers are very delusional. See, we get there, and we're terrible. And we hit 120 shots, and we only hit one good shot, but we think the one good shot is who we really are, right? The 119, that's just a mistake. I wasn't thinking. And then, even though we stink, we get to the golf course, and maybe it's a man thing. We decide... There's four options for the tees to hit from. Let's go to the very farthest ones, because we're pros, right? We're the best golfers. So we're quite delusional. And we think what we need is, is a course that is harder for us. And that's because we don't realize, hey, you can't even putt. And you're thinking you're going to hit the ball like Tiger Woods pre-2012, right? Sorry, I have to put that in there for you, you golfing fans. Now, this, this delusion there, when people think that the power of God is for, you know, you should walk out and be able to touch people and they get healed. I have, I have two concerns as a pastor and as a guy who reads a lot of theology. The first one is, 
I think we're possibly overestimating our ability to simply live faithfully. Um, We can't seem, says Paul, to live obediently day to day, moment to moment. We can't even seem to keep our house clean, to please our families, to do our jobs well. We can't seem to say yes to God and no to the world on a moment by moment basis. And we think, however, no, that's okay. I don't need power for that. What I need power for is to heal this guy who's, got, who's deaf or has a, 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 lame, a lameness or something, right? I worry about that because it's simply not true. The problem in our humanity as Christians is not our inability to cure cancer or solve injustice in the world. Our problem is usually we don't know how to say yes to God now in the very simple act of obedience and faith. And if we don't realize that, we miss what Paul is saying. You and I are prone to wander at every step, you know? And what we need power for is very simply for that. We can't even manage that. So before you start going to the back tees and worrying now about every, all these other things you should be doing, have you learned to simply submit to God in everything you're doing? Do you tithe? I'm not talking about an amount, but do you submit? Are you generous? Are you hospitable? Are you uh, not getting angry when people cut you off on the roads as much as you were before? Simple daily obedience. And this leads to the second concern I have with this, is that if we think that that's what power is for, for these big grand miracles, we actually don't understand how history has worked and how the Bible says God has grown his church. Historically, we know why the church grew, It grew by Christians simply being Christians and loving one another moment by moment, day by day, through trial and through trial. It wasn't generally through mass conversions. In fact, if you've ever worked in a Christian ministry, you know that although hundreds and hundreds of people will claim to be a Christian, a year later, very few of them are living faithfully. And so the way God has always worked through the church is day-to-day faithfulness, day-to-day of the Christian seeking God's will and obeying it. Moment by moment. It's the mom who's at home faithfully taking a nap and then waking up happy and teaching her kids who God is and loving them. Cooking, maybe. It's the dad, or he's a stay-at-home dad. It's the modern age. I don't know. I'm not passing gender issues here. But whatever it is, it's that faithfulness, moment by moment. So before we get too heighty about thinking it's all about these grand miracles, let's remember Paul's very clear. You need all the power of God to simply endure And to endure means to hold a position under attack. If you're being attacked, you need endurance to weather that storm as long as it's coming. Patience, then, is what you need emotionally and spiritually to not do something you shouldn't when God doesn't seem to be reacting as quickly as he ought. When when Israel is is before the Red Sea in Exodus 14, Moses turns around because they're all yelling, and where is God? Where is God? Have you led us here to die? And Moses says in Exodus 14, 14, "Um, shut up. It says, be still, but trust me, the Hebrew says very clearly, quiet, be still and know, or be still and let the Lord, or what was it? be still and watch for the Lord will fight for you. Something to that effect. I don't remember the exact wording. And what he's saying is, he literally says, shush, be quiet, be patient, wait, stop thinking you have to do something to fix this. And so God, Paul says, you need that power of God to endure when you're being hammered and to be patient and trust that what God says he will do. That's what we need the great power of God for. First and foremost, says Paul, because without those things, you, your faith disappears. Because without those things, a new believer doesn't have the roots of deep faith. When, in, when a fight comes, when resistance comes in the world or in the family or at work, they run. So they need endurance. And if you're a long-time Christian, what you need is patience because life is not going to go the way you think. It won't. And you need to say, I'm going to trust that he's going to do everything as he says he would because he said so. And that requires patience, and Paul knows it. And so he says his primary concern is not curing the cancer, but securing your soul forever. That's his primary concern. The perseverance of the saints is more important than the comfort of the saints. And that is what Paul's getting at. Now, if that's what we're to do and how, we can, how we're to do it through perseverance and faith in the strength of God, how can we possibly do it? Because we do have a problem. Because he says it's not just to endure patiently, but it's to do it with joy. That's a lot harder. You see... You never, okay, maybe you can, I'll have to think deeply, but I don't know of a time when you are required or expected to to endure and to be patient that is a pleasant situation. It's usually not pleasant. You're enduring something that is unpleasant, because otherwise you wouldn't call it enduring. You don't say, I'm enduring this ice cream. (laughs) That's just not the way it works. Um, 
So you're enduring. So it's, so it's by its very nature, he's suggesting you're going to, there's a number, it's a young church in Colossae. You're going to find some troubles as a young church. You're going to need endurance and you need patience. And that's hard and you have to do it with joy. But how can you be happy when you're getting hammered? How can you be happy when you're worried about tomorrow? How, how can you possibly do it? Anxiety is the, mo- is the number one mental illness issue on our campuses and in our world, by far. And I'm not talking about chemical anxiety that requires medication. I'm talking the generalized anxiety that people in general in Canada feel very anxious about everything. Tomorrow, what their kids are going to be like. We're always kind of amped up. And so why? How, do we, how can we possibly fix this? And the answer that Paul gives them is so simple. It's in verses 12 to 14. He just tells them the gospel. He just reminds them of the truth. And I said it so often that your emotions can't be trusted. Your emotions are going to worry about tomorrow and your health and everything else and your money. Paul says, in those moments when your emotions cannot be trusted, remember the gospel. And Paul lets off a litany of beautiful words to them. And he's doing something that is not a New Testament thing. In the Psalms, you see it repeatedly. And one of them is Psalm 42. And look at what the psalmist says. This is one of the sons of Korah. It's not David. He says, um, let me find it. Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. My soul is cast down within me, therefore I remember you. And what he is doing in the Old Testament, what we are to do all the time, is we encourage ourselves in the gospel by preaching to ourselves. We continually say, why are you a mess? Why are you struggling? Don't you remember what God said? Don't you remember? And of course, that doesn't heal everything right away. You're still going to be anxious. But Paul says, remember the promises. Remember what he's done. Continually tell yourself what God has done for you. And look at what he does say. He reminds them first. He says, God has qualified you for the inheritance of the, of the saints. Qualified you. Think about how encouraging that is. Meaning, you are not an heir to anything as a human being. You don't deserve anything but death, says Paul. But he has qualified you. I mean, he has come, he has taken the one who is not worthy to be an heir to eternity and bliss and all these things, and he has made you qualified for it. He's made you an heir. And that all at once, look how encouraging it is, right? It says, first it humbles you and says, I didn't deserve it. I'm weak. I didn't choose God. Remember, I'm being filled. He's qualified me. I couldn't have qualified myself. He loves me. But it also, but it also at the same time knocks me down and says, boy, I couldn't have done it without him. I shouldn't get too high and mighty because I'm just a sinner, but he loves me. He's qualified me. And that reminder that you've been qualified means you don't have to qualify yourselves by being a great mom, a great dad, a great golfer, a great pastor, a great tither, a great server in the church, nothing. Nothing you do qualifies you for more or less love from God once you are saved. You are loved eternally, completely. Qualified. You can't be disqualified. Now, Then he says, and he uses this beautiful Jewish language again, you've been delivered and you've been redeemed. To be delivered means to be saved from something, right? And he reminds them, you were in this dominion of darkness. You were a sinner. You were dark, you were blind, you were wandering. But I have delivered you. I've saved you out of it. But he didn't just save you and drag you out. What he says is when he says you were redeemed by it, he says, I've paid the price so that you no longer have to go back. You were once a slave to this sin, but I have paid everything that you owed, so you no longer owe anything to anyone else. You are free. You're free. So you first, again, it humbles you because you know you were delivered. You couldn't get yourself out of your sin. But you were loved so much, even being a sinner, that he paid the full price for you. And so you're humbled knowing you're a sinner, but you're, you're built up again knowing how well you are loved. Okay? And then, of course, your, your sins are forgiven. And what Paul, when he does this, he's saying, you're going to have trouble. And the way you endure is by remembering. If you fail as you're enduring, as you're holding a shoulder against some sort of a, a trial in your life, if you fail, it doesn't affect your eternity. Your job is to try to endure. And if you fail, God still loves you. If you're a Christian. If you're not a Christian, you're enduring for the wrong reasons and you won't endure. That's not a knock. It's, it's the truth. And he says, if you have patience you're going to then be able to weather those storms more maturely. You're still going to struggle. Life will still be hard. But you'll be able to understand, like the psalmist, why am I doing this? Trust in the Lord. It'll be better soon. And this is what Paul says. You are to live for him. You can't live for him without him empowering you to live for him. And the only way you're going to do this with joy is if you know that it isn't dependent. Your success isn't dependent on you, but on what he has done. Those little bracelets Christians sell, you know, what would Jesus do? I don't like them. 
I know it's a million dollar industry. Somebody's making money off those. I don't like it. It shouldn't say, what would Jesus do? It's what has Jesus done? Far more important. What has Jesus done? Because then that frees you to do what Jesus would do, right? So let's think that way. This is what Paul's saying. Your only hope in life and death is that you are not your own. If you know your catechism, you know that. Let me pray. Father, so much more can be said. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for Paul. Thank you for scripture. Thank you for this church. Thank you for the gospel above all and those wonderful words Paul reminded the church of in, in Colossae. Thank you, Father, that you qualified us. You looked at us and we, we see things. We, we see things and we, we wonder if they're good investments and we just don't invest. We don't help them if they need too much work and too much time. It could be a house. It could be a people. But you, Father, saw people who were broken, had no hope at all for themselves, could offer you nothing. And yet you came and you, um, you identified with our sin. You bore it on the cross. You took our punishment so we could get your reward. Father, we thank you for that. Father, I pray that everyone here would know that joy, that peace that comes with knowing that they are qualified, delivered, redeemed, and forgiven, as Paul says. And if they don't know that, Father, I pray that this would be, uh, even here now, you would be working in their hearts and spurring them on to um, seek you more in word and prayer and community, whatever form, God, that you would draw all people to you for your glory and not for ours. Father, we love you. We pray this all in your son's mighty and merciful name. Amen.